Thanks for staying after lunch. Um, uh, hopefully, I won't be too um, sedating uh, in this time. Uh, like he said, I'm uh, MD, so proof that a doctor can do this. Um, I joined Jonathan's lab two years ago uh, when I kind of uh, had an interest clinically in acute myeloid leukemia and a, a big interest in the tools that um, had just come to Vanderbilt uh, and really wanted to, to kind of use uh, CYTOF uh, and flow cytometry to further study uh, clinical samples of AML that, um, that I have uh, the ability to, to acquire through the patients I see. And so that um, started a couple years ago. So I'm uh, still a relative newbie to, to the world of, of CYTOF and flow, but I think um, this is uh, something that with a little hard work, you can definitely get up to speed pretty quickly on. Um, so just a little background, um, because I'm a physician, I think I have to take a little bit of time to tell you about why I study the disease I study. Uh, AML is a deadly disease. Um, it is probably not as well known as some of the other major cancers, uh, like Dr. Brody was talking about, um, similar to lymphoma, but it does, uh, AML is probably the deadliest of any blood cancer. Um, we see about 15,000 new, new cases a year and 11,000 deaths. If you're over the age of 60, you, you have a 90% chance of being uh, dead in, uh, within five years of the, with the disease. Um, we haven't really changed our therapy in the last 40 years. When we do get patients into remission, about half of them uh, relapse, and about 30% of patients never achieve a remission. So really, I think the, the biological uh, problem in treating AML is that these cells resist therapy, either as obvious overt disease that you can see um, you know, easily in the bone marrow or as minimal residual disease that you maybe, maybe can't see much of or, or don't see at all with the techniques that we use uh, today. Um, and so this is all uh, sort of in the backdrop of our uh, increasing understanding of AML as a clonal disease. Um, I think in the past, uh, AML has been thought of as a sort of cytogenetic morph morphology um, and that prognosticated someone's outcome, but now we're starting to understand um, the interplay of clonal dynamics uh, when we diagnose AML. And, and this is a, a figure from a paper that was published in 2012 from Tim Lay's group where they uh, were able to see using next-gen sequencing that um, many, uh, four in this case, clones existed at diagnosis and actually the rarest of the subclones uh, was the one that uh, evaded treatment and eventually relapsed uh, over a year later. And so um, this is kind of in contrast to the, to the old view that I just alluded to of thinking about AML in, in terms of cytogenetics and morphology or in terms of one mutation like a FLT3 mutation or an NPM1 mutation. Um, <clears throat> so the emerging view is now that it's, this is a clonal disease and there might be more than one mutation, but they might or might not be in the same, in the same cell. Um, and we need single cell understanding and a single cell approach to really uh, do better in treating this disease. So this is actually from another uh, uh, paper uh, from Tim Lay's group where um, he, this was in cancer cell uh, earlier this year, and they basically showed that um, a diagnosis in AML, you might have had a founding clone at some point, um, but they weren't even able to find this founding clone with this uniting uh, mutation, DNMT3A mutation. Uh, but they, what they did found, find was that there were, there were three major subclones. So one had a FLT3TKD mutation, uh, not as common as the ITD mutation, which was in a separate subclone. Um, and then a 2%, 2 of the, of, um, a sort of a 2% allele ratio, really, they didn't actually find these cells. But in, inferred from the, the genetic data, they saw that the IDH2 mutation uh, was present with this uh, DNMT3 mutation, which was uh, co-occurring in all of these clones. Um, and the prediction of, you know, clinical, uh, someone, someone that sees patients and thinks about FLT3s as being a really, really bad um, predictor of, of survival um, might predict that the FLT3 mutation uh, subclone would be the one that relapsed. But actually what they found is at relapse, it was all this uh, third subclone, uh, which had the IDH2 mutation. So I think this argues just in general uh, to the idea that we need to start thinking about AML as a multiclonal disease and, and really with the tools that we have, understand it on the single cell, uh, the subclone and single cell level, um, or we're really not gonna understand this disease um, good enough to treat it better than we do because we do a terrible job of treating it. 
Um, and so the questions that come up in my mind as I think about this is, you know, I'm interested in, in how, how these, these AML cells resist therapy. And one of my, um, uh, I guess, hypotheses is that looking at AML patients early in treatment um, can help us understand uh, which cells resist therapy, you know, because we can see uh, with the proper sampling, we can see uh, over early therapy uh, these cells persisting longer than other cells and maybe persisting uh, and never going away. So the question is, you know, what is the fate of these clones early in disease before the relapse time point? <clears throat> and then can we track these subclones at the single cell level? And, and really the eventual goal down the road would obviously be to find a better way to, to, to take care of the resistance, resistant cells as they come up. Um, and so, you know, the, the approach thus far in finding subclone, uh, you know, these subclones has been to use uh, genetics, to use uh, next generation sequencing, um, which is a great technique, but it, it doesn't give us the actual cells. So we, um, we're not able to actually, you know, sort the cells. And, and I think, you know, the stuff that Aaron showed earlier is, is really mind blowing to me. And I think, uh, you know, it'll be great to have that published because I think it really confirms a lot of my um, uh, kind of suppositions and, and theories about how AML works. But, um, but it's, it's great kind of tandem data to, to say that really getting at the actual cells that resist therapy is more important than um, having this broad understanding of the genetics. Um, and so what we did at Vanderbilt, you know, in a very, in a small world, you know, in our own little world to try and understand how AML um, resists therapy better was to first devise a scheme uh, where we would take um, bone marrow from the patients at all the clinical time points, but we didn't want to do extra bone marrow biopsies, um, but we wanted to get at least all the ones that were done. So typically we do one at diagnosis, we do one at day 14, which is in the middle of induction treatment. And then we do it at, at recovery when uh, the patient has had time to have their, their counts go down and then come back up. And we, we see if there's, there's AML or leukemia in any of those time points. And then eventually they might relapse. We'll get that sample as well. But we also wanted to look at um, peripheral blood because a lot of patients have leukemia in the peripheral blood. And, and we don't really sample that actively clinically. And we don't um, really look at it to, to assess therapy response that much. Uh, it's definitely not standard, standard of care. There's some small studies that looked at that. And so we wanted to take those samples and run them you know, through the ringer of, of mass cytometry. So one of the things we had to do first was come up with the panel. And the panel that we used uh, kind of when we started this a couple years ago was a panel that was largely based on kind of the, the the consensus diagnostic uh, markers that you want when you do AML diagnosis. So uh, that's what most of these are. And then we had some, some room on the panel uh, for secondary markers and then biologically interesting markers. Um, but we really wanted to pull apart the myeloid space. And I think um, maybe alluded to by other speakers, but what, what you really want when you do a, a CYTOF uh, um, experiment is to pull apart your, your subset, you know, the, the sample as best you can. So if you want to get at T-cell uh, heterogeneity, you need a lot of T-cell markers. You don't want uh, a lot of myeloid markers. And for this, we wanted a lot of myeloid markers. <clears throat> and then we put them through the Cytoff and proof that not all Cytoffs are Giants fans. Ours is a Vanderbilt fan. Um, <laughs> we have a Cytoff 1, and it is yellow. It is a great um, 70s kind of Formica yellow. Um, and it works just fine, and we, we, we love it. Um, and then, but obviously, as we've talked about, when you do this uh, with many, pa you know, with several patients over many time points with millions of cells per time point, you get a lot of data, and you have to be able to, to understand it um, in a way that, that makes the, you know, that gives it a purpose. Uh, you know, you want to have a real application for this data. And so one thing that, you know, I loved it when uh, Visney came out about a year ago because I was using Spade, and I think Spade is good, but when you really want to see how you know, well your cells are being tracked, if you want to see the single cells, um, Visney just works better for me because I can see individual cells go or come, um, and I'll show you that data in a sec. So I really don't need to go into Visney. Um, Aaron did a great job, and others did a great job of, of talking about um, what Visney does, but again, if you you know weren't here or um, forgot, uh, just pulls apart really your your subsets, and it basically 
reduces dimensionality. So 30, 40 parameters are displayed relatively um, accurately, relatively faithfully to their 30 dimensional phenotype in two dimensions. Um, and proof that this works, this is data from one of my patients, um, and you can see um, how well Visney pulls apart the, the subsets. So here we have the CD4 positive T cells, and this panel didn't have CD8 on it, so these are CD4 negative, um, but really CD8 positive, probably T cells, um, NK cells, um, and expressing CD56 and CD16, um, B cells, monocytes, um, and then the AML cells here in the middle that you know, you can see a, you, you can have a, a really broad immunophenotype for your AML. You know, usually in, in clinical um, cases, we're confined by a 12 or 16 uh, uh, marker immunophenotype, uh, and we can really um, expand that with, with uh, CYTOF. So what I'm going to jump into now is, you know, visualizing kind of the purpose of this was to visualize patients as they get treated, uh, how, how does their AML respond to treatment in, uh, when visualized in basically a 30-dimensional space. And so to remind you, you know, we can, uh, I just showed you this slide, but this is a different patient, um, and I can find all of the uh, immune cells and the AML cells. And what's, what's great about Visney is you can, and Spade, you can do this too, but you take multiple uh, files and you put them on the same uh, Visney run. And then you can get a kind of a breadth of the phenotype that the disease has over the time that the patient's being treated. So, you know, what we've seen is that the immunophenotype changes. Um, and that's been known in AML, but not quite maybe on this uh, sort of level of uh, not, not at this um, small time frame. And so what we can see is uh, large immunophenotypic shifts uh, during the course of therapy. And then over here we see that, you know, we can display heat uh, for any cell on this uh, Visney map, uh, heat for any marker that we measured. And so these show you the ones that we used to get the sort of the, the normal immune cell populations. And this patient, you'll note, doesn't have any monocytes. And I don't think he ever had monocytes throughout therapy, which is um, not uncommon in AML just to have uh, really low monocytes. Um, so this is all the patient's time points on one Visney map. I'm gonna, you're going to lo look at a lot of Visney maps. So, um, hopefully this will make sense as we go. But uh, basically, this was the, the beginning time point, the day zero marrow, the diagnostic um, uh, Cytoff run. And so what we see is, you know, th there are rare cells uh, in rare normal cells. Most of this sample, 90% of this sample, is AML. And I have, you know, heat uh, displayed as cell density. So um, really you can see where the cellular abundance is. And so you see that there are subsets of AML here, 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 here. You know, th this AML is heterogeneous for sure. And we'll see how these subsets change over, over therapy. So this is the marrow at day zero, and this is the, the blood at day zero. And they're, they're pretty similar, um, but, but not identical. Um, and this is something that is known in AML that sometimes you do get uh, different expression of markers in the blood, the peripheral blood and, and the marrow, but it's not really used clinically because uh, we don't know what to do with it. So hopefully we're going to uh, figure that out. But, <clears throat> but after three days of treatment, uh, this patient has a marked shift in his immunophenotype from sort of this part of the, the Visney map down to this part. Um, and, you know, they look, uh, the, the, the clones that we had, or the, I shouldn't say clones, the subsets that we had before um, have shifted. And, you know, this is a quick change. So this is probably due to, um, and this is the peripheral blood, so the, this could be due to uh, marrow releasing uh, cells that are high for markers that uh, define this immunophenotype. And I'll tell you, one of the markers was CD184, um, which is one of the markers that keeps um, uh, immune, uh, hematopoietic cells in the bone marrow. Um, and so CD184 was high on these cells after three days of treatment. Um, and then after six days of treatment, we see a shift back to a uh, similar uh, immunophenotype to what uh, the patient had a diagnosis. Um, and in 30-dimensional space, you can see how this is, is shifting around. Um, but then by day 14 in the peripheral blood, what we often see in, in most patients, even, uh, patients that have remission and patients that don't, we usually clear all the blast from the peripheral blood, but really that's not where we look to say rem remission occurred. Uh, it's, it's in the marrow. So the peripheral blood is relatively clear of blast, though there are uh, these cells that occupy that um, 
area of the map. Um, and <clears throat> when we look at the, the, the marrow, we actually see that there's, a, there's still a ton of, of AML there. So this patient did not have a good uh, response to, to therapy, um, went on to get subse subsequent um, induction therapies and never achieved a remission. Um, but when you uh, compare, and we'll, we'll, I'll do this in a little greater depth uh, in a minute, but when you just compare looking at um, day zero and day 14, you see there are obvious, uh, obviously different um, expression profiles uh, in these two samples. So this AML changed in response to therapy, uh, though we didn't get the therapy response we wanted, there was some effect of the therapy. Um, and this, this is just to show that um, both in patients that achieve a remission and achieve patients that don't, uh, the mass cytometry data we collect does uh, recapitulate the data that we get clinically. So um, at day zero, this patient, uh, by the, the clinical sort of uh, CLIA certified um, lab numbers, had a, you know, between 91 and 97 percent blast um, in the marrow and peripheral blood, and, and we found pretty much the same thing. And then across, um, this is a different patient than what I just showed you, obviously, but across treatment, uh, the patient, um, the cyto mass cytometry data and the clinical data, which is fluorescent flow and manual, um, you know, H&E stains, um, they correlate well. Um, and then with a patient that has a, a refractory AML, we see the same thing. So over here uh, is the mass cytometry, and here's the clinical data. And we see that these patients, um, this patient, basically had you know, a similar amount of a disease in the blood as, as measured by both, the, both of those um, modalities. And then at day 14, uh, you know, this is really refractory disease to see 80%, 90% of the marrow still uh, with uh, acute leukemia at day 14. Um, so just to contrast that, um, I just want to show you what, what vision e looks like in a good response. So this is the patient I showed you a second ago um, that, that had a good response, but at day zero, the, the marrow was 90, uh, 90 percent, 90 plus percent um, AML, and CD33 is the heat here instead of uh, cell, cell abundance. Um, but the, the effect is the same. So at day zero, you have a lot of disease. By day three in this patient, um, most of the, the AML is kind of uh, being obliterated, and this area over here that we didn't really have many cells, um, which are T cells mostly, uh, starts to appear. And then by day 10 in the blood, um, we see really no cells uh, left in that, that uh, virtual marrow space that Visney created um, of AML. And then in the marrow, we see the same. Now, someone asked uh, earlier, about MRD uh, analysis, and VISNI uh, is potentially a useful tool. There are a lot of technical difficulties, I think, that are presented um, by doing, using CYTOF to, to do clinical MRD um, uh, compared to fluorescent flow cytometry. One of them, as was mentioned earlier, is that you lose a lot of the sample, so if you're losing 50 percent of your sample or more, uh, when you run it, can you really be sure that, that what you see really represents what's there? So, um, but, but just in our initial uh, assays to test the idea that MR, uh, whether these could be used for MRD, um, I think that at least conceptually it's, it's, it's there and, and um, we'd love to, you know, once we collect enough patients, we'd love to kind of an, do that analysis to see um, whether cells that are left in this uh, Visney map um, will eventually, you know, those, will, it, will that predict outcome eventually, like MRD. Um, but I don't know if the sensitivity is there. One of the other issues with VISNI is you can only display, I think, 30,000 cells, even though it can, it can handle more than 30,000 cells with one run, I think it still just displays 30,000 cells, so you can only visualize that many cells when you look at it. So um, uh, that's another uh, issue. Um, so that was a patient that got a good outcome. Um, and then kind of an intermediate outcome where a patient had refractory disease and then was, was uh, treated. I'll just spend a couple slides on that. But here you see um, this patient had you know, a lot of blasts in this area, and I've circled the, the AML area. All of these are, are mature immune cells. Um, and then at day 14, we see you know, the shift of basically all the disease to this one spot. Um, and then the second day 14, so that right after the, the second induction therapy, um, 
there is no uh, AML in that area and there's only a few cells here. And clinically, the patient um, was clean. And then at recovery, the patient was called clinically in remission, um, but you do see a lot of cells in this uh, area. You know, we wonder if those will, are MRD and if that will be, be a predictor of bad outcome for this patient, but um, haven't followed this patient long enough to know. But, but this was clinical remission, even though the visiting map thought a lot of the cells looked like um, the original AML. Um, and this is just a characterization of, of what I just showed you. Um, so the, the green cells are the day 14 cells and the white cells are the day zero cells. And you can see that the day 14 cells um, really you know, highly express markers that were you know, expressed but not nearly as highly in the, the original sample. So CD38, HLA-DR, um, and CD34 definitely enriched on that subset as well as CD13. So, Kind of similar to, um, I think, in vain to what Aaron was, was showing, um, these cells expressed some stem-like markers, um, but these cells resisted therapy, and so whether stem cells or not, um, these are bad cells for this patient. Um, and so maybe it's le less about the markers and more about the biology. Um, <clears throat> so kind of backtracking to my patient that had a, ref a refractory um, AML, um, I just wanted to show how you can dive in uh, to that refractory disease and really uh, understand um, the, the clonal architecture based on proteomics, um, if not genetics. So what we can do in visiting is we can gate, just like any 2D plot, we can gate these cells out. And you can do this in the Cytobank visiting or the MATLAB visiting, which is what I use to do most of this because the Cytobank visiting has uh, yet to be, to be live. But but it'll be, it'll be the same, you can you gate these out and re them. So basically what that does is it takes a small area of a map and it kind of blows it up to a, a larger area um, where you can really start to understand subsets. And obviously displaying it like this doesn't give you as much as putting density on it and really understanding where the peaks are. And so when you look at this um, patient's AML from day zero to day 14, the things that jump out are, you know, there are areas of the map that are there at day zero that really aren't there at day 14 and vice versa. And so the question is, you know, what, uh, what about these uh, subsets uh, is it that, that allows them to be sensitive to, to therapy and about these subsets that allows them to be uh, resistant? Um, or the corollary, are, are these cells um, just these cells but express different markers? So I think we don't really know uh, you know, because we can't, I can't inject a dye into a patient and then uh, follow the actual cells that were there and see if they changed their expression. But the question, uh, either, either answer, I think, is interesting. Um, and it's a, that's the question that we're, we're actively trying to answer um, now. But, but really what we can do is we can subdivide these, and this is just by hand, using the density as kind of a guide. So kind of the way we do, you know, gating in a biaxial um, sort of normal flow gating. Um, there are uh, automatic tools that, that do this as well. Um, there are several algorithms that have come out in the last couple of years that will um, do automated um, kind of finding of subpopulations on, on Visney data or just raw um, uh, mass cytometry data, but I, I actually like the hand gating uh, for now. Um, I think we can do a better job than a computer um, at some things probably. Um, but eventually I think uh, just for normalization and standardization, having a, an automatic way to do this would be great um, if, it, if it recapitulates this sort of intuitive stuff that we already know about um, uh, gating uh, immune cells. Um, and so what you can do is you can look and see how abundant these populations were. And this just proves that these, these populations were once rare um, but now become prominent. And so the, the question still remains is, you know, what happened to the cells? Were they killed and other cells just uh, became uh, relatively more abundant or, or did the cells change? Um, but, but you can see, see by these gates that the relative populations change significantly uh, with respect to their, um, their number. Um, <clears throat> and so one of the things that we wanted to do to kind of try and e express how these cells change or, or what are some of the qualities of the change um, was to, to take a normal, healthy bone marrow um, over here. Whoops, that's a touchy mouse. Um, take, take normal, healthy bone marrow, which is over here, 
um, map it on the same VISNY map as, uh, as AML, um, and this is this patient's AML, and these are the same gates that I just drew on the previous couple of slides. And what we um, wanted to show is, you know, here are hematopoietic stem cells in this VISNY map. Um, and then if you map AML, it overlaps with hematopoietic stem cells, and that makes sense um, because the hematopoietic stem cell is one of the progenitor cells for, or one of the, you know, the cell that gives rise to AML is, is what's thought. Um, so the diagnostic sample overlaps with this, um, with the stem cell area, um, but actually, uh, I'm going to skip that. At day 14, uh, you actually move uh, away, um, and so what we what we've done is measure Euclidean distance in Visney, um, which is uh, pretty easy, but but pretty intuitively gives us uh, sort of a number to represent how far uh, apart two cell populations are in 30 dimensions. Um, and obviously this is an approximation because you're kind of taking a measurement of uh, a map that approximates that distance. Um, but nevertheless, it does gives us, gives us uh, a way to quantify how far cells uh, have become, uh, have moved, how far they've moved from the, their original place as well as from uh, sort of an anchor point, which would be like a hematopoietic stem cell um, in this. And <clears throat> back to this slide, and you can see the distances of sort of the mature cells, so early cells in this map, and every map's going to be slightly different, but in this map, we're in the 20s, monocytes, um, mid-20s, and then these other mature cells were um, quite far away um, compared to the diagnostic sample of AML, which most, most of um, these uh, subsets were, the, these are the medians, most of the medians were within, you know, uh, 7 to 20, uh, which is closer than the progenitors, but then at, at treatment, um, everything shifted away. And so uh, one of the questions uh, we have about this uh, sample in particular and this concept in general is, you know, what, um, you know, what signaling and genetics uh, is at play here? And I think Aaron has answered some of that, um, but I think we still have a lot to answer, especially in, in adult AML. Um, and so that's what we're, we're looking into now. Um, and so I, I really, I'll conclude there. I think um, I just wanted to give an overview of how VISNY can be used to, to visualize a therapeutic response um, in patients, in real patients, um, and then start to kind of probe whether how resistant cells um, you know, resist therapy and, and how they change, because I guess we want to be able to find these resistant cells and identify them and identify um, these changes before we can uh, really understand how to treat them better and target them. Um, and then, uh, you know, eventually we'd like to move towards, you know, looking at signaling and, and how that is affected by treatment and how that contributes to, to those populations' movement away from that stem cell core um, into a kind of an altered core um, and what signaling uh, mechanisms are at work that we can maybe exploit to kill the, the AML. Um, so that's where I'll end, and uh, I'd just like to thank the, the lab, obviously, and our clinical uh, collaborators and, and the patients who uh, give us all their samples, um, and these are my funding sources. Uh, take any questions. Thanks. Good, good question. Um, so now, obviously, we're, we want it to be as uh, controlled and consistent as possible. So what we do is we cryopreserve the PBMCs um, and uh, and look at them all in the same day, same busy run or the same Cytoff run. Um, so we um, hopefully, eventually, you know, we would get to the point where we could run clinical samples like you know in real clinical time and then have that data to you know structured trials around or something like that. Um, but right now, I think we're not, you know, at least on our side, top, we're not to that, that, that point of being able to really, um, I want to be able to trust the data is not changing from day to day. And I think that's the best way right now. 
So as we're gathering this information, any one patient, I do all their samples at the same time. Um, so, but they're out of the body only for um, an hour at top. So we basically get them out of the body and into cryopreservation as quickly as possible. Um, I had a quick question. So yeah. you started to touch on it. Have mm -hmm. you, for the different patients that you showed, mm -hmm. have you tried combining all of them and putting them together through the? Yeah, case? that's that's a great, great question. Um, so I think I have a slide somewhere. I have like a million slides. So bear with me for a sec. Um, <laughs> sorry. There you go. So this is uh, a busy map of normal and patients. So you see the uh, this is five patients um, and how they they sort of cluster. I, this is not a, um, a mature figure. This is a kind of an earlier run, but this is a VISI map of four pa uh, five patients and normal. Um, and these were not, uh, I did not select out blasts. So a lot of these patients do have a lot of mature uh, cells. Um, and then their blasts kind of co sort of co coalesce on this side of the VISI map and the, the normal early progenitor uh, GMP and HSPCs are all right here. So um, that's kind of how it, uh, it looks when you do five and when you do 10 or 15, it kind of looks the same and they just kind of blur together a little more. Um, so the idea of being able to take a bunch of normal and a bunch of AML, put them on the same Disney map and just be able to be like, that's AML, that's normal is, is not looking uh, so uh, possible, I guess. Um, I, I would say th there's too much in common of some AMLs look really rudimentary, like HSPCs, like 34 positive, 38 negative, with very few lineage markers, and so they're just always going to fall in the same area of the map as as as, uh, as the HSPCs. Um, and so, um, but I think when you do a patient uh, within their own context over time, that's where you really start to see the AML jump out. Um, and, and because it changes too, you can really, uh, I think, identify it better that way. Um, Did you try combining both patients and time points into one analysis? Um, both patients and time points. Like, like take both patients and then all, all their time points. Their time yeah, points yeah I've kind of done every iteration of that idea. Um, I, I don't display it because I don't, I don't know how to make sense of some of that yet. Um, I, I kind of showed what I can explain decently well. But, um, but yeah, you, you know, I, I've, I've done uh, a lot of Disney runs and, and all of those kind of combinations. Um, you know, the problem just in general is that that gets to be a lot of cells unless you want to subsample only like a thousand per, and, and a thousand isn't enough to get the really rare, you know, we want MRD to be at least one in 10,000 or one in 100,000. And so um, with that as kind of the backdrop or concept we're shooting towards, um, subsampling a thousand cells might be interesting, but it doesn't give us uh, probably as much sensitivity as we would like. But but it is interesting for just looking at. Well, you're using the the original MATLAB version for that. Like, um, yeah, we can talk later. But yes. one of the things we've been doing internally is trying to push the limit of how many cells you can get to. To so visualize. If you wanted to do like one point something million. We can yeah, I think the newer actually the newer uh, the newest version of the MATLAB version of ISNI do, is faster than the original versions, and so. Um, but yeah, the, this, the speed of the computational part is, um, can, can be a limit. I mean, it's less than an hour usually though, so. So one, one thing you're proposing here is to maybe follow specific clones with the markers, but you also mm -hmm. mentioned, I think, that you cannot really distinguish whether this could be just upregulation due to treatment mm -hmm. of some, of, they're not really different clones, they're just changing phenotype mm -hmm. uh, due to treatment. So. How would you propose, do you think that in vitro uh, treatment with the drugs could recapitulate some of those changes that you Yeah, could, could I, th I think that that has promises, you know, is promising. I think taking, um, what I'd like to do is take pati uh, patient samples, put them in, in xenografts and treat the xenografts um, as well and see if that is the same or different than, you know, if the expression changes like it does in patients. Um, so that's kind of one future uh, way will go, but we don't. We have to collaborate for that because we don't do. I don't do mouse, mouse models, so. That's a, but but that would be fascinating. And I think in vitro stuff, there's a lot of in vitro assays, both with Cytoff and um, and elsewhere. Like a Finnish group does um, kind of 300 uh, drugs, and uh, they had a paper in Cancer Discovery last year that showed it actually 
worked pretty well for some patients in predicting their response to certain drugs that might not be, uh, it's not the, the drug we wouldn't go to necessarily in a refractory AML patient, and they showed responses in some, some un, you know, less used drugs by using that in vitro screen. So that's a possible avenue to go, sure. Aaron. That was beautiful, and I, I mean, I'm totally biased because, of course, we're, we're sort of uh, working from the same uh, playbook here, but I, I, I was just thrilled to see that you're applying these techniques clinically yeah. to, to samples from patients that you know and you interact with, and, and you, you're really sort of pushing this forward into the, into the real translational realm uh, versus us amateurs, you know, uh, yeah. mucking around in, in the right. biology lab saying, hey, right. this looks cool. So right. that was just a comment. Yeah. But the um, right. question is, though, so you've, most of this work now is with surface markers, yeah. and I know you're moving into signaling, mm -hmm. uh, but I was wondering if you've had a chance to look at sort of basal uh, cleave caspase or phospho gamma H2AX or any, any indicator of apoptosis or DNA damage so you could sort of resolve what Sasha was getting at, which is are these, are these clones dying off and then a new clone is replacing mm -hmm. it, or is this um, just a transition so in cell state? It's being done, yeah. We're, that's, that's our, our current uh, and sort of next, next step is to assess cell death uh, as time goes on. Um, and, you know, we have done, let's, sorry, go back. Um, get to see all my <laughs> slide vomit. Um, so, so this is uh, one visualization of, of a, a patient's uh, Visne map. So, so like 16 markers, and then their single cell stem response uh, to a couple stats, or it, with, in a couple stats. And so um, I love to do this same thing basically with, with uh, markers of apoptosis and cell death where we can see, you know, this, these cells over here are in the process of dying and, and these cells are actually alive. But this is, um, you know, a, a sort of what you've done but just on a, a different visualization and, and a smaller level for sure. So definitely not, uh, you're not an amateur at multiplexing uh, stems, I'll tell you that. Um, anyway, but yes, we're going to do that. Doing that. Appreciate it.